Autonomous Networks offers significant benefits to telcos, but where are we on the automation journey? Here to discuss are Manish Mangal, Global Business Head of 5G and Network Services at Tech Mahindra, Tomak Gersberg, Head of Axiata Group Future Networks, and Tammy Wyman, Global Head of Telecom Partnerships at AWS. Thank you all for joining me today. Thank you. In our industry, lots of people have definitions of what automation means. What does it mean to you? Start with you, Manish. Oh, fantastic. You know, we, um, this is the new uh, word that we have, of course, the industry has been talking about for the last year, year and a half, about what does it mean to be autonomous network. Uh, and this is not new from a word perspective, but our vision towards uh, what does network need to look like it from an end-to-end -end life cycle, from planning, design, deployment, and operations and all the pieces that we can put in place to allow network to run by itself. I mean, at the end of the day, we have a situation in our industry where the new technologies are coming in faster pace than we can get the skill sets developed. And the innovation that we require to enable the services for our customers need to be enabled at the faster pace as well. So the only way to do it at the cost-effective nature is to drive this autonomous network journey that allows us to really create a full life cycle of a network, which includes actually all the different uses of AI and Gen AI into the embedded parts of the network life cycle. And to me, the autonomous network, the, the end state for that, and you know, TM Forum has defined the stages of the autonomous network, so that's a very great uh, blueprint for us to be able to follow. But how do you bring to life is really dependent upon how we create the technology solutions that makes the end game come to life, which basically means that you can auto-deploy, auto-configure, auto-provision, auto-heal, auto-operate, and you have a closed-loop automation that basically requires the least amount of human intervention when it talks about the end-to-end -end life cycle of the network. So to me, that's a vision, that's a future, and I think there is a long way to go before we achieve it, but uh, we are taking all different steps, and from Tech Mahindra's perspective, we have put a very detailed playbook in alignment with what TM Forum has defined as the different stages of the autonomous network and in partnership with AWS to really create that sort of a, uh, the, the roadmap that allows a operator to get to the autonomous network. Yeah, from my perspective, uh, I think it's important that we're witnessing a step change in the industry now. Uh, we have automated networks for some time. And now we're starting to talk about autonomous networks. And I think there's uh, you know, still some variations around what that means, what the benefits are. But really for me, when you get into autonomous network, networks, it is about the ability to learn. The network is able to understand the context, make a correction, and learn from that so that it does not repeat the same thing again. And that's where you start uh, as uh, you know, for network operators, you feel like you might be losing the control of this. And so I think there's a, you know, a culture shift that needs to happen at the same time. But the technology is in place to have autonomous networks. And we're starting to see some early implementations of this. Yeah, actually, I don't have much to add because I, I'm just in this opinion that autonomous network needs to be self-aware, needs to be aware of the services of the users on the network. It needs to be able to change itself, optimize, out of hill and so on. So this is, and yeah, I agree, this is also a big mindset change because we are now moving to this kind of declarative approach that is already well known in the, uh, in the cloud world, but it's new to the telcos because very often telcos still follow the process. They optimize the process. They automate the process, like uh, kind of, you know, like robotic process automation. But now this new approach with the declarative way, cognitive networks is changing a lot. And I'm very, I'm very much dreaming about autonomous 4.0 network, you know, in my workplace. But Tomek, you're, you're where a lot of companies are right now as well. For the two of you who are maybe further along on that journey, for a network to self-configure, self-heal, what components are necessary for a company that may want to start down that journey? Yeah, well, I think there are, uh, you know, the kind of basic components. So one is the ability to think, and that is using Gen AI to be able to 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 put that, uh, you know, 
brain behind it and give it the ability to think. Um, but then once you have that, you need to be able to detect what is an anomaly, what is, what is something that's business as usual, what is, you know, what, what is the scale of this. And then once it detects, how quickly can it detect? That's where you get into latency issues. And I think that's been one of the major impediments on autonomous networks to date has been solving the issue for latency because you know milliseconds can, and can create major catastrophes in network operations. And then once you have that ability to uh, uh, quickly detect, then the network needs to be able to heal itself and reroute. So all of those components together really are, are what uh, enable an autonomous network. And so we uh, have the technology that's available, especially with Gen AI and a lot of the uh, large language models, which are being created by some of the announcements here, like Telco um, Alliance, which is bringing together network data uh, from different operators uh, using the uh, open brand standards. And I think we'll be seeing more and more data that's available to help make better decisions when we're looking at the, the, the decisions that the model is making, but there's still a lot to do around the processes and the enablement of the field force. Uh, if I add to that, actually, Tammy, uh, you know, one area, and you, you touched upon that, is really the data part of it. And, and I think for the autonomous network to be successful, the, one of the things that is the biggest impediment that I have seen is really the ability for us to collect data across all the different sources in a unified way and make sure that the data is a very meaningful data so that we are able to then actually apply the learnings and the different engines on top of it. So that's the first step from a building block perspective that I would look at and say that how do I get the, the data uh, lake built that is a common data lake. The second part is actually creating an observability infrastructure so that the telemetry data that comes from the infrastructure can actually feed through the data lake into the engines that, like you said, learns itself and then from there it builds a variety of different models whether they are the models to actually do more deployment efficiently or the models to really operate in service assure uh, at the most efficient, cost effective points. So I think if I kind of layer, build the three different layers, the one is the observability layer that allows the, the info, then the data that collects the data in a very cohesive way, and then the AI models and Gen AI models that sit on top of it that actually are purpose built to use the data to allow for a specific type of use cases. And these things can actually mushroom into a variety of innovative situations because no single uh, uh, provider in the world can actually innovate across all the life cycles. So once you actually create the marketplace and ability for anybody to come and innovate and deal, build different types of specific use cases, that can actually happen when the rest of the plumbing like the data lake and the telemetry with observability is in place. So if I kind of layer into three things, I think those three things are the fundamental building blocks to really achieve the autonomous network vision. I'm not so much concerned, you know, about this part because the, the telcos, they have a lot of data. They see a lot of data. Over the years, we've been investing in the observability and this kind of business is already, I would say, well, well established. We can monitor every le level of the network. Uh, and in fact, you know, we are throwing more data away than we are really keeping. One of the reasons is because, you know, at that moment we can't really get used of, the, of those data and I hope, you know, that like the Gen AI will help us uh, to filter out, you know, what is important and how to, you know, turn it into, into the knowledge and into actionable uh, uh, tasks. Um, my concern is rather related to the ability to execute because we may have the knowledge about the network status, root cause, analysis for any, any topics, but how to execute it if you have a lot of legacy that simply does not talk the new language, right? So actually the right path for the evolution of the networks to get benefit of the technologies, as you mentioned, you know, it's like the technologies are just, you know, in, in our hands, you know, we could, we could use it. But how to do it in the way that those networks and this equipment that is still now in use and has not built to be, you know, automated or it has been not built to be a part of the autonomous organism. This is the challenge. Mm -hmm. And along those lines, on the other end of the spectrum, 
how, what strategies are you using to deal with partners or providers that are coming to you with different uh, kind of uh, strategies or different products that then you have to try to create this end-to-end -end ecosystem? Uh, what is the strategy for getting through that? I think you, you present a really a realistic case, you know, and it's, so it's really good to understand what's happening in the life of someone who's in the trenches every day. And when I, th when I think of, well, what are the parallels? Um, I think it starts with getting that legacy into an environment where you can make use of the data and the automation. So, you know, for example, we're finding that, you know, and networks are, are difficult. That's why they're still the, the environment that has resisted moving into the cloud to a certain aspect or, you know, in, in certain conditions. So we're finding that operators are moving, for example, their disaster recovery onto the cloud because it's less, in, less invasive. You don't have to undo what you already have. And so that could be one piece. So then one process of disaster recovery would start being in that, in that piece. And then you might move to your IMS system. So you know, we're, we're finding that it's not uh, all you know, one uh, greenfield network that's rare, the cases that, that uh, appear, but really looking at the brownfield and how slices of that network are being able to be moved into the cloud. So then you start building this environment where certain processes can be automated. I think for me as well, it's, uh, it's also the promise of having an interface which can uh, in be interacting with your operators in more of a natural language search ability that's more friendly. So it, it just helps create that information flow in a more human way and it helps them make decisions more quickly. So it's kind of a balance, I, right? I Between the, the old and the new and there's a path and it's, it's a and process. It will be yeah. built step by step, yeah? It's, that, that, that's, that's obvious, yeah? yeah? Because like it will start with the use cases probably that are now more, the most urgent ones, you know, how to, how to reduce the energy consumption. Yeah, this is like, so with those things, you know, like, because on the other hand, we also need to remember that networks are very physical. There is a piece of fiber optic always there. There is a piece, there is an antenna, there is a connector for this antenna, there is a corrosion somewhere, and you know, the mist is, so it's like, there are a lot of things that, you know, always will be physical, and there will be always kind of manual, but a lot of the services, like the service creation, this adaptation, this, this can be, I believe, done in the first step. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, autonomous car is a great example of yeah. being still physical yeah. and how its software comes and uses it. Uh, and I think you asked a question about partners as well. And I think uh, one of the observations that we have is that, uh, you know, there is a, a, a lot of partners have to come together to enable this journey. Now, no individual, uh, either a OEM or a uh, technology provider or a system integrator or an operator can actually enable this vision of autonomous network that we have been speaking about. At the end of the day, everybody will have to play a role from their strengths perspective, right? The technology innovation has to come from the technology uh, innovators like AWS who build the capabilities and the tools. Uh, then a system integrator will have to play their role in terms of how do you take the toolkit of a technology and help bring that to life given in the environment where there is a lot of coexistence of the existing infrastructure and the new infrastructure is always put in place. So there is a lot of uh, work that has to be done. And the telecom operators have to play their role in ensuring the discipline and the direction that they give towards <coughs> the vision and not let everybody disperse from that vision and keep them on course and ensuring that they're aligned to their business goals and delivering for the customers today as well as tomorrow. So as we all look at the different components of the industry, and all of us have to come together. Now, good thing though is that the end game of achieving the vision of autonomous network is better networks at cheaper cost, which is great thing for the customers and for our industry. So from that perspective, I think there is a strong ecosystem in play. And just from Tech Mahindra's perspective, we have a very strong partnership uh, ecosystem and with AWS that is we are building towards enabling that vision. Yeah, I think that it's a really good point about the ecosystem, you know, and, and I see in the industry, we're moving more and more towards ecosystems where we're coming together, but particularly in this space, we're even to the point where we're seeing the telcos themselves come together to try to solve. Uh, so as I mentioned before, the Global Telco Alliance, where we have different operators coming to bring their data together to make a, a, a stronger, more accurate LLM, initially for customer experience, but also using network data for that customer experience. And then you also see 
uh, a lot around network APIs at this yes. show, right? And uh, it's telcos that are opening up their networks to developers so that they can uh, probe and, and create applications to help make networks uh, run more efficiently to have uh, better inspection of them and you know truly there's a lot of innovation that's coming from the outside world of developers into the networks. Uh, yes this is the pressure actually that we need also to to feel to evolve ourselves because with the pressure you know hopefully there will be also money coming um, and evolution towards like programmable networks that we can give you know this experience to the developers uh, that they also that we can build on their creativity this is something what we really need, and for this we need to have the autonomous networks. Without that, we'll, this change will not happen. Yeah, absolutely. How do you see the the intersection of machine learning and AI evolving in, in autonomous networks, and or how do you wish it would evolve? That's a great question. Would you like to take that? <laughs> it is indeed a great question, and I don't know if anybody can predict yet what what scale at which the AI and the Gen AI will actually evolve and play. Uh, one thing is sure for though, it will have a very significant and important role to play. Uh, today we are starting to see some very specific use cases that are enabling a specific uh, problem solving. Like you know, one of the things that we have brought to life is an ability for Gen AI to take the data in the operations and turn that into a what we call as a ticket resolution advisor. So that when the tickets are getting formed, people with Gen AI capability can start asking questions. The incident managers can ask the question through Gen AI in terms of what likely is happening in the network and what should I do? And that becomes a lot more adaptive standard operating procedures rather than a rigid ones and gives a little bit more intelligence in solving the problems as you see in the, in the network. But that's just a very small incremental first step. Uh, I do see that you know, it will take all its shape. Uh, three, four years from now when we will be talking today or just like we are talking today, we will not be talking about what role AI will play. We will be really talking about the amount of disruption the AI and Gen AI has brought in in terms of the management of the end-to-end the end -end life cycle. I will just add one, one thing that the progress what we have seen, you know, in like with ChatGPT or with other tools, it's coming because, you know, this information to be processed was available. Telcos networks are still pretty closed, right? We don't share the information. Building, building, let's say, strong models require access to the information, right? Now we, let's say, the, we can, ChatGPT can program because GitHub was open for years. And this is the common knowledge that we share. I believe also building uh, open ecosystems in the telco and open access to some of the data can accelerate this progress very much. Because like, okay, consumer data, this is one thing, we don't need to share it, but the information or how the network elements behave. But there's nothing competitive behind that. This is kind of, you know, common, I'll say if we can share it for the common benefit. Yeah. And then in the telco industry, um, you know, we're, look, we're a year, a year and a half into the Gen AI revolution here. And I think you know you'll see the telco industry continue to be very protective with the relationship of, with the customer. So uh, now we're seeing most of the Gen AI, Gen AI use cases to be more internal, whether it's employee facing, and then with network, certainly the challenge, as I mentioned before, is the, around the latency. So it's it's a difficult use case, although it is internal facing, a lot of data, a lot of systems to bring together, and it needs to be real time. Uh, I think we'll see a lot of uh, evolution towards autonomous networks and uh, I would say eventually we'll be seeing a lot more consumer applications so uh, digital human interaction and retail environments um, and that kind of will be a stateful interaction that you bring with you you know as you have an interaction with your provider on the fo on the phone um, whether it be in a digital environment so I, I think you'll find that it becomes more pervasive uh, with the consumer well, thank you very much for your insights. This is an exciting time in our industry, and you all illustrate that. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.